Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Lombardo, and welcome to this panel uh, discussing free trade agreements and the benefits to adopt. As we are here um, running the logis in Vietnam, obviously we are very keen to discuss what's going happening in Vietnam, particularly how Vietnam is uh, engaging in free trade agreements. Uh, Vietnam has been one of the pioneers in Asia uh, to engage with the EU-Vietnam uh, free trade agreement. They're also a key player in the RCEP, and also uh, they are a signatory to the CPTPP agreement. So really they are very uh, much engaged in the free trade agreement and preparing themselves for the future. Joining me on the panel today, uh, we have Gyuen Doi Hong from Vietnam. Uh, we have Bipin Balakrishna from Singapore, from KPG Singapore, and we have Russell Skula uh, based out of Melbourne, and myself, I'm based in Singapore, so we are scattered all over the place. So uh, let me start off our discussion by asking each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves in terms of relevance to the experience they have in free trade agreements, and then we can go on to discuss uh, some pertinent questions regarding free trade agreements uh, in the region. So can I start with you, Russell, uh, maybe to just share with us some of your background, what, what you've been doing in, in this area and some of the achievements in your career? Sure. Look, thank you very much, Joe, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I spent 32 years with the Ford Motor Company based in New Zealand, Australia and China. I had extensive responsibilities for trade policy throughout the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, in recent years, I have a consultancy business, I, uh, Tato Creek Advisory. It specialises in trade policy advice, project work, government engagement strategies. Uh, I've also uh, done an extensive work on advising on trade opportunities that are open to uh, businesses as well. Thank, thank you, Russell. Uh, Bipi, would you like to uh, go next, please? Sure, Joe. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good evening if you're in Australia. Um, I, uh, my name is Bipin Balakrishnan. I am a partner with uh, KPMG. Um, I lead the Singapore India corridor, but uh, you know, my first love, as uh, as uh, you know, Joe would definitely know, is uh, is trade and customs. Um, I've been a consultant uh, as well as I've worked in uh, industry uh, on the trade and customs side in uh, four continents and uh, multiple countries. Uh, and I've uh, kind of watched how, uh, you know, multilateralism in uh, free trade agreements and and uh, and generally global trade has, uh, you know, gone up and come down and gone up again, etc. So, um, you know, I, I continue to advise uh, companies on how to get the most uh, benefit out of these trade agreements. And I look forward to today's discussion. Bipin, thanks very much. So, Mr. Hong, over to you, our Vietnam, Vietnam visitor. You're very welcome. Please uh, give us your introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hong from Vietnam. We are a startup company in uh, providing supply chain solution to enterprises. Wow. Uh, we have experience in custom clearance, import, export, and transportation as well. And we are looking forward to fruitful meeting today. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Mr. Hong, let me start off with you then, because obviously, uh, we are all excited about uh, the future in Asia and especially Vietnam. Can you share with us uh, a little bit of, you know, what are the challenges currently facing your organization and businesses in Vietnam in this transition um, from, from the COVID disruption, but also we see a lot of activity, a discussion between onshoring and offshoring from China into Vietnam. Give us a bit of a sense of what's going on in your, in your area. Uh... Everyone in the part of the world say that COVID is a big challenge, but to us it's a, an opportunity. Right. We are very, very, very uh, uh, open to that uh, chance. And recently you see that uh, according to the tipping point of COVID, some company they transit from China to Vietnam. And right. we recently we have an FTA with uh, Europe. We, we, uh, the Europe will leverage around not, almost 100% of the tax to our export to the Europe market. So to us, it's, uh, we will welcome this new opportunity as well. Yeah. Right. And, and just to carry on before I move on to the, our other colleagues, how mm. are businesses preparing mm. to use and adopt these free trade agreements in Vietnam? Are they finding it difficult or is there a lot of support from people like yourself or the government or other agencies? Uh, to have this FTI with Europe, we, ha we have a nine years preparations as well. So to us, we are easily adopt this one. 
It's right. not from the uh, overnight agreement. It's a nine years agreement. Right. So we right. have a long time preparation as well. So I, we are um, uh, convinced that we are well prepared for that adoption. Yeah. Right. Excellent. That's very positive. Bipin, let me come to you. You know, uh, there's all, when, when a major uh, trade agreement is being invoked, there's always practical uh, difficulties, hurdles, etc. But how should businesses address the new and existing agreements uh, to, to move forward, especially when you've got multi-agreements, multi some of them overlapping, some of them interlaced, and there's also sometimes uh, different rules of origins that are at play here? Uh, of course, you think the transition time, there's some overlapping, but towards the big picture, we need to adjust our legislations as well. Okay. Yeah, we believe that in custom area, in, in the tax authority, we will do some uh, some uh, revision in our uh, current and existing document okay. to um, to be confirmed with uh, the the new Euro and Vietnam FTI. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Hong. Can I turn to Bipin? Bipin, in your experience in the region, the same question, how, how would that play out in your mind? So, Joe, I think uh, first thing is that, you know, it's a, it's a popular misconception that, uh, you know, the, because it's a misnomer, the free trade agreement is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually conditional trade, right? Yeah. So uh, what companies really need to do is understand what those conditions are. Firstly, understand what the, the specific FTA, you know, what are the benefits that it gives. Then try and understand what their supply chain looks like, where are they sourcing from, how are they manufacturing and where their customers are. And once that is understood, then they need to understand what the rules uh, of origin are for, for applicability. But the other important element in this also is to uh, you know, to be able to understand what your what your production process is, where are you, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing and where are you selling it to so that you are able to make sure that you're meeting the conditions, the qualifying rules, rules of origin uh, under the various uh, free trade agreements. And then, you know, especially in the Vietnam context, uh, uh, given that Vietnam has, you know, multiple free trade agreements and pretty much covering the same areas, uh, you know, there is a possibility to look at what is the best, uh, you know, opportunity. Yes. No, so I, I think, you know, I think the, the important thing, Joe, is to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, people understand what the, uh, you know, companies understand what is their supply chain looking like, right. where do they want to sell, and what are the specific opportunities that the free trade agreements uh, provide. Right. Um, so I think, I think uh, you know, that's what companies need to really understand and get prepared for. But, uh, come back to Mr. Dong. Um, you, you heard what, uh, sorry, Mr. Hong, you heard what uh, Bipin has said about supply chain mapping and rules of origin. Um, clearly, it's already quite a big challenge to prepare your certification, your, your cost statement, rules of origin, proof, etc. How easy has the government in Vietnam made it for companies to apply for certificate of origin and, and facilitate uh, the uptake of uh, free trade agreements? Uh, recently, our Vietnam government uh, mentioned about the one-door policy. In the past, to apply for the CO, the certificate of origin, company need to go through many doors, I mean many offices and, and ministry. Right. But now they can go through only one door by application, through online application. And okay. that they can get certified very easily. Yeah. Okay, that's very good. So it's a one-stop shop, basically. Yeah, so one-stop shop. One-stop yeah. shop. Excellent. So, yeah. Mr. Hong, can you tell us um, what has been the success rate of the European Vietnam Free Trade Agreement? Uh, how many companies have taken advantage or, or is it still too early to understand the success rate of this uh, agreement? Uh, we all see that the first sector to get the success is the government and tech tie in Vietnam. So right. we do believe that the government and tech type will blooming in this country in, uh, in the coming years. Yeah. Right. So we, we hope that in the five coming years, our GDP will increase in this area from less than like two point something to three point something. So at least one, one rate increase in the next five years. And the main contributor will be the tech tie and the government. Okay, okay. so Bipin, coming back to you on, on the issue of, uh, of uh, rules of origin, because uh, the rules of origin can be uh, as long as a piece of string, as, as short as, uh, as, uh, as anything. Where, where do you think this alignment, so you've just heard uh, um, Hong say that in Vietnam, they have aligned to a one-stop shop, which is great, because the rules of origin, uh, are, 
Is this a, a benchmark example we could apply other, other places? Could this be a facilitation of trade and made it easier? So uh, I think uh, over the years, uh, Joe, I remember when, you know, free trade agreements were were new to this part of the world, you know, uh, uh, early 2000s, uh, when Singapore was, you know, uh, getting into this uh, uh, in a big way uh, and how the rules of origin were. And there were so many things which were, you know, unknown. Uh, third country invoicing, back-to-back uh, -back form, you know, in, in Atiga and the ASEAN, uh, you know, uh, after context, uh, the back-to-back -back, uh, certificates of origin. Right. How does trade actually, you know, because trade is pretty complex. It's not easy. It's not right. simple, right, across different countries, especially where there are um, multilateral agreements. Um, you know, it's become very, very difficult and very complex. Right. But over the years, we in this region have the advantage of having gone through AFTA, uh, having gone through several other free trade agreements, and therefore the you know how the rules of what the rules of origin are, what the product specific rules are. Because remember that this is, as, as you know very well, Joe, that the the general uh, rules of origin are not the only ones. You have product specific rules of origin as well. Right. And now there is, you know, all these FTAs. If you look at the EU Vietnam uh, FTA, uh, there are specific, uh, you know, areas for uh, dispute resolution. Those are the things which are now becoming, you know, more and more uh, prevalent in FTAs, and that really becomes, you know, makes it much easier for businesses to actually, uh, you know. Follow the rules and get the benefits. So, so Hong, uh, I, I'd like to point to discuss with you about a dispute resolution, because this is all always uh, the problem or the proof that the system really works well. Uh, because you apply, you get your certification, but then if something goes wrong, there's a dispute resolution. How do you think this is going to work in in Vietnam, considering you've got these three big agreements going on, and ca ca companies are going to want to take advantage of these uh, of these uh, agreements? So you mean that if we have a too many agreements, we have some overlapping, right? Our there could government, be some, uh, there could be some disputes yeah. of rules of origin or, or classification yeah. mm, or, or mm. something of that nature. Mm, mm. So as you see, uh, when we go to a funnel, only one funnel, meaning that's only uh, one one shop uh, uh, policy. So we we will can solve that uh, dispute as well. Right. And the, our government commit to uh, revise all the regu uh, re legislation. Uh, we can make that the uh, 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 overlapping. Yeah, okay. they're, they're going to reduce this one in the coming future. Okay, so yeah. what should yeah. companies do to avoid mm -hmm. going into dispute or going into mm -hmm. problems? What should be the mm -hmm. the attention points or the or the, or the points that you should take mm -hmm. care not to get mm -hmm. into a problem area? What is your advice on that? Let uh, me can you can me can you help me? This one, this is the question as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, and, you know, I think what you mentioned, Hong, is, is important. Because, you know, the, the disputes, uh, uh, to my mind, are uh, not necessarily because companies don't agree with uh, something. Because of the lack of clarity, I think uh, sometimes the disputes come up. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, you know, what companies need to do is, uh, you know, understand and have dialogue with the, yeah. with the, with the authorities, with customs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, uh, Mr. Hong, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks like yourselves who are on the mm -hmm. ground mm -hmm. have to probably facilitate that discussion between, you know, traders, uh, you know, importers, exporters and the government. Uh, maybe the Ministry of Commerce or Ministry of Trade, in order to be able to uh, clarify and uh, you know sort out those disputes. Okay, right. okay so right. let us turn now to RCEP because RCEP is the new trade agreement on the block. It's just been signed, I think, what last week or the week before, so it's going it's very fresh. What what what, what is now? Um, what are companies doing to prepare themselves to to launch RCEP? Uh, Hong, is this something that you are seeing as an initiative that has got momentum or is still very fresh? The asset one is quite fresh to us. Yeah, we are prepared for the EO, uh, FTAs, and the CP, the TPP. But the asset is someone something quite uh, quite fresh. Yeah, right. But but do small companies? Because clearly the small SMEs are the ones that are um, going to benefit quite a bit from these agreements. But are SMEs, small companies, do they understand this agreement? Do they understand the difference between? Uh, the impact of, of, of RCEP or, or CPTPP, 
mm. or is there still a lot of education and training that needs to be done? Let me give mm. an example. If I'm if I'm operating in China, yeah. and I want to move my company or I want to start up a new company in Vietnam to benefit from these agreements with the EU, etc. So I have uh, these uh, three agreements. Um, is the infrastructure are the company supporting who will support me moving to Vietnam ready, or mm. is still some time before mm. we can get an effective implementation. Yeah. Okay. Can you repeat the questions again? Uh, yeah. you, so, you mean that the company have, do company have any difficulty in differentiate the asset and the, the, the EO FTA, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. It, all the documentation, mm. what you're exporting and all mm. the, the different mm. information you need. Mm -hmm. uh, to our point of view, in terms of uh, supply chain consultation, we, we, do, we do see that the company o only try to understand the area they are working on. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then the, um, let's say, uh, co a company they try to export to the Euro, U Europe, they try to understand the advantage of the uh, U, uh, Euro and Vietnam FTI one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I'll come back to a bit in a, mo a bit in a moment, but uh, Hong, one other question for you in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. How ready are the service providers, like the folding agents mm -hmm. and the customs, to deal with these different trade agreements now? Are, are they ready or do we still need to have some time for them to understand the rules and the procedure? Mm. I, I do believe that the supplier, they are quite ready and they are looking for this one. Okay. In, the, in the past, let's say in terms of equal term, we, pref we prefer the uh, FOB, but now uh, the volume of export to Europe increase due to the tax reduction. So okay. I do think that they prefer, prefer to provide the end-to-end -end logistic service to Europe as well. Right. So yeah. I do believe that the supply chain uh, uh, supplier, they are ready, they get ready for this one. Yeah. Excellent. This advantage. Yeah. Bipin, there's, there's a question come through. I'd like to ask you this one here. Um, it's, it's about ASEP. Uh, so it says ASEP covers free trade, free, uh, sorry, ASEP covers free trade and mentions about the e-commerce. Would you see the de minimis values be standardized between all these countries or would you be able, uh, are able to trade freely no matter B2C or B2B? What I understand previously, FTAs is only B2B. Well, what is your understanding of this, uh, Bipin? It's a little bit of a, uh, a complex question, I think. Yeah, and so, Joe, uh, you know, uh, obviously e-commerce is uh, one of the things which has been given a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of focus, uh, especially in the, in the newer uh, FTAs. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a um, lot of um, uh, focus on that. Right. Um, now, you know, that's also in keeping with what all other regulatory aspects are uh, covering. I mean, uh, you know, uh, taxes now, you know, going digital, people are looking at, uh, you know, taxing the, I mean, governments are looking at taxing uh, the uh, digital economy. Uh, and, and, and this is, you know, to address some of the e-commerce issues, you know, small packages, um, you know, the the de minimis rules, uh, uh, you know, is, is extremely important. And I think um, this, there are there are uh, areas that have been earmarked in the in the RCEP in order to be able to treat this. Now, the problem with RCEP, uh, not just for e-commerce, but generally speaking, is that it's a it's mega. It's it's got 15 countries. Right. Yeah. Um, Already, we know that uh, you know Australia-China relations are uh, you know are are very uh, fragile, um, and and therefore you know and some of this uh, has not been uh, as you know the ratification has not been ha has not happened. Although it requires only six countries, uh, six of the ASEAN countries and three of the non-ASEAN countries to ratify, it still is fraught with a lot of you know ifs and buts, yeah. right? And it's going to take a little, little bit of time. Now, e-commerce may not be uh, the area which kind of trips everything up, but I think that you know there is still a lot to be discussed and a lot to be scrubbed and a lot to be you know looked at from a geopolitical situation to see how successful RCEP will be um, going forward and how many you know how uh, effective it's going to be because it involves China, it involves Japan, it involves Korea. Now, if you look at it, China and Korea have had uh, you know bilateral FTAs. Yeah. But uh, they've not been part of a multilateral, uh, you know, system ever. Japan and Korea have never been part of an FTA. China and Japan have never been part of the FTA. So part of an FTA. So these are all new relationships that are being forged. Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm just going out on a limb and saying this. I think we're going to see a lot more, you know, 
uh, and, and, and it's taken eight, nine years to, you know, get to where we are today. Yeah. So I think it's, it's uh, a, a lot more needs to be done in this uh, space. And I think it's, um, you know, it is going to be challenging. Yeah. So, so this is a very good point you raise, uh, Bipin, because in fact, when there are heavyweight countries in an agreement, there's always a danger that is skewed towards that, that side of it. In fact, we saw this when the TPP was being negotiated and the U.S. was pulling its, its weight. And then once the, the U.S. pulled out, then it formed a very balanced agreement. Um, do you see that this weight of power could influence and steer the way the relations and the way the effectiveness of such agreements could uh, turn out to be later on? I, I definitely do think so, uh, Joe, because and and if you look at it, the the situation has changed a little bit from what it was, say, three or four years back or five years back, when even through the negotiations, if you look at it, if you look at how the negotiations have panned out over the last eight years or so, um, you know, China's position has really changed. There's a lot of talk about de-risking China, right? Uh, de-risking the supply chain and, and trying to uh, stay China out of the picture and, and, you know, or at least kind of have alternatives to China and which is where Vietnam has really, you know, uh, stepped up on that, on that, uh, on that front. Uh, but this brings them back into the, into the mix, right? This brings China right back into the mix. But I still believe that China has to, has to now, uh, you know, adapt, uh, adopt a, a, a very different position than it was used to like four or five years back because it's got problems with India, it's got problems with the US, it's got problems with the EU on trade, on trade terms, right. uh, with Australia as well. And therefore, it's gone, it's, it's going to be a very, you know, fine balance that they'll have to strike in order to be able to get the benefits out of RCEP and keep the member countries, you know, right. satisfied. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Hong, what, what is your view about the China relationship within the RCEP and how can Vietnam either take advantage of the RCEP or could be put in a disadvantage if companies want to move out of China to Vietnam? Because I know China is trying to uh, protect its manufacturing base and Vietnam is trying to promote its, its manufacturing base. And the free trade agreements is one way to help Vietnam. How do you see this developing uh, moving forward? Uh, you know, trying to keep back the factory is not only only the, the effort. See, this is the China. First of all, they are facing the COVID nineteen. Right. Second one, the labor force of China now very become very expensive. And third yeah. one, the China have a very in very difficult polit political situation with many country. So Vietnam in diff uh, different our uh, political stability will attract the company especially the fbi from europe to to vietnam right. so i think in the coming five years uh, more and more company will come to vietnam our labor force is still cheap uh, our government will welcome the, the fbi one and the political stability is good enough to attract the the foreign investor yeah okay so, so, so is sorry sorry if i could just add one one thing to what uh, hong was just mentioning yeah you know Vietnam is not just now, you know, benefiting from the fact that companies are actually looking at de-risking the supply chain and therefore want to move slightly away from China, have yeah. at least some part of the procurement, have some part of the sourcing, some part of the manufacturing done elsewhere. And Vietnam is, you know, prime uh, candidate for that. But yeah. what Vietnam is also doing is that once China has come into the RCEP and what manufacturing is happening there, now part of that can, you know, be some pieces of that manufacturing, some pieces of that sourcing can be now moved to Vietnam. So on both ends, yeah. Vietnam seems to be you know, well positioned to get uh, benefits out of this uh, situation right now. Right. Yeah, agree. Okay. So time is pressing, gentlemen. So I'd like to start mm -hmm. to wrap up this. So, uh, Mr. Hong, one of the things that clearly uh, is it's very exciting and very positive to hear your comments about Vietnam, and we're all excited about this. But moving on, uh, when we take companies who have to deal with the free trade agreements for the EU, the RCEP, and eventually when the CPTPP goes into force, companies got to organize themselves, have to reorganize their structure and, and move forward. What is your advice to customers or what is, what's your advice to businesses and customers now operating in Vietnam to prepare themselves for a much more complex playing field moving ahead to take advantage of these free trade agreements? Uh, first of all, they need to understand the advantages of every uh, uh, FTA that Vietnam is signing with the, 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 the part of the world. Let's say when we go back to 10 years ago when we signed 
WTO, right? Our government do many commitment to become full membership of the WTO. And the, the, our enterprise, our SME, they try to understand the, the positive aspect of such agreement and they right. learn and they move forward. So now we have FTA with Euro, we have a, a asset and our, uh, we, our, we advise the enterprise, they need to uh, see the perspective of this one and they can consult, they, they do consult the consulting agency for further advice. Yeah. Excellent. So you are saying that this journey Mm. of learning has started 10 years ago so people have not just woken up yesterday but they started yeah, 10 years yeah, ago yeah prepare. yeah in our why, first time experience yeah we yeah. have experience for that one yeah. and this is why you are very positive about uh, mm. the future this excellent well what yeah. from a system point of view what about from an automation digitalization how can this help companies to become even stronger mm. and more efficient in uh, in their business uh, operation moving on mm. again please uh, your questions Okay, so how can companies mm. improve their performance by digitalization using mm. technology mm -hmm. to improve mm. what they are doing? Mm. Recently, we talked about a lot about digitalization. Digitalization is not only technology. If you buy a software, you cannot go digitalize. Digitalization, we talk about technology and the prerequisite people and process. Right. So the people need to get qualified for that one. We uh, advise the company to get the SKA, S means skill. They get skill or at least they have knowledge, KB knowledge or awareness of the challenges. So yeah. when they are aware of the digitalization, they are well prepared for this one. Okay. Yeah. Digitalization hey, again, help the company can connect with the other part of the world very quick, especially for the startup company. Yeah. yeah. Again, very positive uh, comments, mm. uh, Hong, we're mm. hearing. But is this across all the sectors of industry in Vietnam or is, is some sectors more advanced than other sectors? For example, uh, the electronics or in the, in the part of, uh, of, of specialist uh, uh, parts, are they the same across Vietnam or some mm. sectors stronger than other sectors? Uh, I see the strong movement in the, uh, the manufacture, uh, manufacture sector and the service sector. Yeah. Okay, the service mm. sector. Okay, mm. good. Uh, Bipin, your takeaway is now getting companies prepared for this positive uh, happening in Vietnam. Uh, people who are moved away, moving away or trying to reposition because clearly it's not going to be easy just to reshore and to, and, to, and to reposition the manufacturing. How should people in the eagerness to take advantage of the free trade agreements in Vietnam cautiously move in that direction? So I think, uh, firstly, uh, Joe, I don't think it's an option anymore. I think this is a, you know, uh, it's something that you need to take, uh, you know, advantage of because uh, of the number of FTAs that Vietnam has. If you are looking at entering into uh, the ASEAN market or if you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, being in Vietnam, manufacturing in Vietnam and selling outside, um, you know, if you are not taking advantage of the FTAs, then you're losing out. Right. It's not just a, a, an additional advantage that you have. So what what companies really need to do is understand the FDA, like I think uh, uh, Mr. Hong was saying as well, uh, understand what uh, what the FDA is, uh, what the benefits are, what the rules are and what the conditions are. Yeah. And then, you know, you talked about digitalization as well and, and you know, the, the technology. There's, there's uh, you know, several uh, pieces of technology that are there, but, uh, you know, which can help you to understand and, you know, make your process in such a way that you get benefits out of this. Companies need to think about that and get on this, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 and get take, start taking advantage of this uh, of these FTAs. It's a it's a big big saving that is there. Um, you know, um, there are a number of benefits that come out of the FTAs, and uh, you know, it would be unfortunate if companies were to miss out on this opportunity. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you very much for a very good discussion. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights. Of course, this is all new territory. Uh, there are still possible areas of failure because of the detail that hasn't come out yet, but certainly the overriding signals are positive and very encouraging. Hong, thank you for joining us and good luck in Vietnam. We hope to come and visit you next, uh, next time as, uh, the, the borders are open and maybe next year we'll have lodges in Vietnam in Vietnam. Bipin, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I'm sorry we couldn't get Jeff, uh, sorry, Russell. Uh, thank you, Bipin. Uh, sorry, Russell, we couldn't connect with you, but again, Thank you for participating in uh, in Logis in Vietnam. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye thank bye. you. For